Okay, first of all, uh, I would like to uh, really thank Rainer for his, uh, his very gracious uh, introduction. Um, this afternoon, uh, he came to the hotel where I'm staying, uh, full of gifts, including his latest manuscript, which I will dutifully read, and I'm sure that I will learn a lot uh, from his latest work. I would also like to thank the two deans uh, who, who are here, uh, the Dean of the Faculty and the Dean of, of Philosophy. Uh, I was telling the Dean of the Faculty that every time I see him at a talk of this nature, I feel uh, deeply reassured. Uh, I would like to thank the university and the center uh, for, for the hospitality, uh, which means a lot uh, to some of us in, in a world uh, in which uh, uh, solidarity and hospitality seems to be increasingly uh, criminalized. Uh, I have a thought for uh, Andrea, uh, who has been very nice to me, and I understand that she can't attend tonight's lecture because of uh, a small, small accident, as well as Elizabeth. And I'm really happy to be in this magnificent room. Uh, I've never been in a room like this, and uh, I hope it won't be too intimidating. So uh, uh, during the first lecture, which took place in, uh, uh, at the university, uh, I intimated that <clears throat> the, the government of human mobility uh, might well be one of the most important problems to confront the world during the first half of the 21st century. And since then, my uh, take on this hasn't changed. I think tonight I still believe that uh, this, is, this is the case. Um, I think that the capacity to decide who can move and who can settle where and under what conditions might become the core of uh, ongoing political struggles over sovereignty and nationalism, uh, citizenship and identity, or for that matter, security and freedom. I uh, strongly suggested uh, the other day that uh, with uh, Western colonial expansion and more decisively with the advent of uh, capitalism, the raison d'etre of the border is to attend to key questions such as uh, to whom does the earth belong, who can lay what types of claims to what parts of it, and uh, uh, for that matter to the various beings who inhabit them. In other words, who determines its distribution or its partition? I really believe that that is what borders are all about. That's what they have been all about, and that is what they will be all about as we enter this new century. In framing the question of the border in this way, I was trying to show that the power of the border <clears throat> lies in its uh, capacity to regulate the multiple distributions of populations, and by populations, I don't simply mean human populations, I mean also uh, non-humans, to regulate their distributions over the body of the earth, and uh, in so doing, to affect the vital forces of all kinds of beings, uh, enhancing some of these vital forces for some, and crippling them for others. Uh, and in the process, uh, sorting out who is whom, who should live where, who can move under what conditions, and so forth and so on. I also argued that as the 21st century unfolds, a global renewed desire from <clears throat> both citizens and their respective states for a tighter control of mobility is evident. 
And wherever we look, in fact, the drive is towards enclosure, or in any case, towards an intensification of the dialectics of opening and closure. So if you want, two things are going on simultaneously. Um, we are the world is becoming more and more entangled. So on the one hand, planetary entanglement, and on the other, uh, uh, a desire, if you want, for secession. Uh, a desire for separation, a desire for enclosure. And what we have to be able to think is that simultaneous process. I then uh, went to some extent uh, showing that the belief, one of the dominant myths uh, of our times, is the belief that the world would be safer if only risks, ambiguity, and uncertainty could be controlled. And this is shared worldwide. The belief that uh, uh, we would be safer, our lives would be enhanced, if only identities could be fixed once for all and secured. And these beliefs are gaining momentum. Where the discourse of identity used to be deployed at the service of emancipation or further inclusion, expanded belonging, that discourse of identity has been co-opted increasingly and put at the service of, of closure. So we live in a world where risk management techniques have become one of the dominant means to govern mobilities. And these uh, technologies are, uh, in fact, proliferating. So that was a short summary for those of you who couldn't attend uh, the, uh, the first lecture. I evoked many more issues, but this uh, uh, short summary will help you to then move into what I would like to share with you tonight. So tonight, I would like to pursue this line of argument concerning the uh, redistribution of the Earth, not only through the control of uh, bodies, but also the control of movement itself and its corollary speed, because it's almost impossible to speak about movement without evoking in the same process speed. Speed and movement go hand in hand. And this has been always the case. This is even more the case today with what some, uh, he is speaking under the control of Reiner, many sociologists now call acceleration. More specifically, I would like to see whether and under what conditions we could re-engineer the utopia of a borderless world. Taking into consideration the contemporary matrix of flows, uh, closures, and circulations, including the circulation of various forms of capital. Now you'll ask me, but why is it important to excavate once again these old uh, utopia, which I don't believe we will ever see in our own lifetime? Why is it important to attend, once again, to what is obviously an impossible intent, the question of a borderless world? I think this is important for a number of reasons. The first reason, which is conceptual, is that from its inception, movement, or in fact, borderlessness, has been central to the utopian tradition. Utopia is about the absence of borders, strictly speaking. And in the first instance, the borders of imagination. The utopic is about the implosion, 
the unfixing of all borders that might put limits to the act of imagination understood in itself as a social process, as a political process, or as an aesthetic form. So in the concept of utopia is already embedded this idea of the absence of borders, of borderlessness. In fact, the power of utopianism resides in its ability to instantiate the tension between borderlessness, movement, and place, which has marked, when we look at it properly, uh, social transformations throughout the, uh, the modern era, as uh, uh, many historians have shown, that social movements uh, are, in fact, when they are at their most powerful, they are about the absence of borders. I think this tension continues in contemporary discussions of movement-based social processes, particularly international migration, open borders, transnationalism, or discussions on uh, cosmopolitanism, uh, which, uh, as we know, have a, a very German inflection from Kant to, to Ulrich Beck and a number of others. And in this context, I believe that the idea of a borderless world can be a powerful, albeit problematic, resource for social, political, and aesthetic imagination. And that's one of the reasons why we have to recover it, recapture it, and redeploy it at the service of uh, an idea of the world that is premised on the, uh, uh, let's say the project of relationality, relations, as opposed to the project of essence, relation before ontology. So that's the first reason. The second reason is that precisely because of the current atrophy of the utopian imagination, Apocalyptic imaginaries and narratives of cataclysmic disasters and unknown futures have colonized the spirit of our, our times. If you want, what I'm saying is that we have too much dystopia and too few utopias. Science fiction, cinema, techno music, all kinds of narratives are saturated by a dystopian impulse. For those of you who are interested in reading the cultural uh, uh, creations of our times, they are, to a large extent, uh, determined and shaped by a dystopian imagination. So obviously, it's not as if we are living in a time of excess when it comes to utopian imagination. And therefore, uh, critical thought, part of critical thought's function is in such a context to, if only, re-equilibrate uh, things and inject a little bit of uh, uh, utopia in, our, uh, in the spirit of these times of ours. And uh, more importantly, because we inherit a planetary history in which the consistent sacrifice of some lives for the betterment of others is the norm. And because these are deep-seated times of anxiety, including anxieties about of uh, racialized others taking over the planet, racial violence is increasingly encoded in the language of the border in the language of security. And I'm sure you understand why, uh, coming from where I come from, I believe that these are issues that we should put on the table. Because contemporary borders are in danger of becoming sites of uh, reinforcement, reproduction, and intensification of vulnerability, for stigmatized and dishonored 
uh, groups for the most richly marked, ever more disposable, those that uh, in this era of abandonment have been paying the heaviest of prices, for instance, for the most expensive period of prison construction in human history, the last two decades of the 20th century. And imprisonment, incarceration, is precisely the exact opposite of borderlessness, just as, at least in American case, slavery was the exact antithesis of freedom. That liberal political order has constantly operated with these two faces, this double body, uh, a solar body if you want, and a nocturnal one, uh, under which, in the shadow of which, those who have been stigmatized and dishonored uh, uh, are sacrificed for the betterment of some, some lives. So uh, that's why I put it on the table. Now, one, in proposing to re-examine the question of a borderless world, I would like to stay away from dominant ways in which this issue has usually been dealt with. That is, either under the sign of Kant, I'm not saying that we have to reject Kant entirely, but we, we really have to correct Kant. Or if, if you are not happy with such a term, we have to supplement Kant. We have to add to, to Kant that which is missing if we want to speak from a global perspective. Because, okay, and I will stop the polemic there, because the, the, the Kant of critical reason, uh, the Kant of the, uh, the human who uh, actualizes his or her potential is the same Kant who, if you look at uh, his anthropology of uh, taste, is a very racist thinker. You wouldn't believe what Kant says about others. It contradicts completely the Kant of the Enlightenment. So there are two Kants, if you want. The Kant of Enlightenment and the Kant of uh, the Ténèbres, uh, of uh, 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 darkness, uh, where, where matters of, of race become uh, uh, totally contradictory with the impulse for freedom. So that's why it seems to me that in rethinking matters of borderlands today, we have to supplement him if you want. And his promise of uh, an unbounded cosmopolitanism, cum post-national politics and society. So that's one, uh, let's say, path one needs to treat extremely carefully. There is a second path one needs to treat carefully as well. It's uh, about treating borderlessness under the sign of liberal individualism, which many consider to be an antidote to the deeply ingrained fascist impulses of, of European bureaucracies. Uh, when you read Hannah Arendt, for instance, chapter two of Race and Bureaucracy, that is what she's basically arguing. That uh, to some extent, if we are to defeat fascism, which she considers to be deeply ingrained in, if you want, quote unquote, the genes of Western bureaucracy, Western political order, including liberal political order, uh, we have to, let's say, uh, 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 recover the emancipatory uh, resources that are put to us by the ideology of liberal individualism. So these are two, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, traditions I think uh, have helped us to uh, think carefully about what a borderless world might be but whose limits are just too obvious for these times of, of ours. 
I think that we should also uh, move away from uh, a third tradition, um, which uh, is trying to um, argue for a borderless world uh, on the basis of uh, a huge attachment to the market principle. There is uh, uh, an economic tradition that believes that, in fact, um, in order to, that there are three, three types of, uh, now, now there's, there's a little problem here. <laughs> Let me just readjust the microphone. I'm not sure that I can do it. Um, uh, are you you're still here following me? Okay, so it's close. I'll, I'll leave it at that because. Uh, uh, so, so you, you do have a, a, a tradition, that uh, liberal tradition, let's call it like that, um, um, which is uh, uh, premised on fetishism of the market. Uh, a market society is, is, is what? A market society is a society uh, where, uh, which has uh, somewhat uh, uh, in which uh, four kinds of freedoms have been obtained. Uh, freedom of movement, of capital, uh, freedom of movement for, for goods, freedom of movement for services, and freedom of movement for human, human beings. Those are the four freedoms, without which there is no market society. As, in fact, the Eucharistic sacramental manifestation of this big ideal we call freedom. It is manifested in the capacity to move of these four key, let's say, uh, uh, agents. So, uh, in, in that tradition, migration is key. And when you read The Economist, the economic magazine, The Economist, The Economist is for the uh, dismantling of borders, including for human beings. And in that sense, they are consequential. They, they, they take to its ultimate limits the uh, uh, fetishism of, of the market. So when I say a borderless world, I'm not talking in the language of the economist, if you want. That's the point I want to make. Uh, I, I'm not espousing uh, this. So what is it that I mean then? Uh, uh, of course, a borderless world would look, would be a, a world of free movement of persons. It would entail it. And this free movement of people would not be restricted to the core economically rich countries or states of the world. It's a world that in which uh, these rights uh, would be extended, including to poor members of the earth. And I'll come back to that distinction a little later. And if you really want me to be extravagant, it's a world in which there would be no visas. There wouldn't be any quotas or bizarre entry categories to fulfill. One could just get on a plane, on a train, on a boat, on the road, the key right would be a right, a right of non-discrimination. So I was extravagant, now I'm serious. It would be a right to not be discriminated. It would be an entirely different kind of right. It doesn't exist so far, if only, or if it does, it only exists indirectly. If it exists as we speak, including in liberal societies, it's in terms of a negative right. So let's turn it into a positive right. The right to not be discriminated. That's what I mean philosophically 
by a borderless world. Let's move beyond questions of visas. These are consequences of a philosophical position. So a right of non-discrimination implying that, yeah, that it would be a world in which circulatory and pendular migrations would be the norm. The norm would be for people to move, for bodies to move. For a body to exist, it has to be a body that is capable of exercising the faculty of motion. There's no body that is not moving, that is not capable of moving, or that which is assigned to immobilization. It's not a human body. So, pendular, cyclical, circulatory migration would be the norm. With longer term settlement, probably less likely, since borders would be easy and open. I'll give you a quick example. You see, for those who grew up under French influence, from those countries which were colonized by, by, by France, I mean, my own country was not really colonized by France, it was colonized by Germany. And then Germany lost uh, the war, and the other powers decided that Germany was not capable of civilizing anybody. Because colonialism was akin to civilization. You colonize, you civilize. And I'm not inventing this. I mean, when you read those documents of the time, one of the reasons why Germany was deprived of its colonies was the decision that, no, because of what you have done, you are not apt to civilize anybody, so we take away the colonies. But that's an aside. So, in those countries in the 70s and 80s, you could move, to, you could go to, to Paris with your identity card. There was no problem of migrants because people knew that they could come and go. The moment you say you can't come, that's when you have a problem. You create a problem and problems were created which we inherited uh, uh, which have uh, led right now uh, in, in, in this continent of Europe to the existence, according to the latest counts, of at least 450 migrant camps in this continent. And at least 35,000 people detained in a whole variety of uh, confinement institutions specialized for foreigners, which raises all kinds of questions, some of which some of our biggest writers, and Ms. Césaire and the others, raised long ago in his discourse on colonialism. Is it true that the destiny of Europe ends with, a, with, with camps? Is it true that at some point, the camp, the camp form, as Agamben puts it, might be delinked from the history of Europe. I think we have to go back to some of those foundational questions. These are the questions one would want to raise when we bandy the concept of a borderless world. So I could go on and on this, but I think you get a little bit where I'm coming from and where I would like to go. And now, second set of remarks. I would like to make some remarks about the difficulty in the liberal tradition to indeed imagine the possibility of a borderless world. What is it that philosophically exists in that liberal tradition that makes it, if not impossible, at least extremely difficult to imagine uh, concept of a borderless world. I think that, and here I'm relying a lot on a work done recently by an Israeli scholar called Hagar Kotef in a, in a book which is called Movement 
and the Ordering of Freedom. It was published last year by Duke University Press. It's really a must uh, uh, in terms of, of reading. I rely a lot on her here, and I will, quote unquote, supplement her after exposing to you what is her principal thesis. What is her principal thesis? Kotev tells us, I think quite convincingly, that uh, liberal political thought has always been saddled with a contradiction when it comes to imagining the possibility of a borderless world. And this contradiction stems from its conception of movement. She shows that, in fact, two dominant configurations of movement constantly come into conflict with each other in the liberal tradition. On the one hand, movement is seen as a manifestation of freedom. And at the same time, and on the other hand, it is seen as an interruption of order. And this being the case, one of the uh, functions of the state is therefore to, to craft a concept of order, stability, that is reconcilable with its concept of freedom, that is movement, as well as a concept of freedom that is reconcilable with its concept of order. It opposes these two things. I think I mentioned that uh, last, it was two days ago, when I gave you the example of how African cities operate uh, in a compositional manner and so forth. So, but here, uh, Kotev uh, draws on a whole set of, uh, a battery of uh, uh, sources and shows convincingly that this opposition has been absolutely central to uh, liberal thought, and we see it uh, uh, including today. So it has led to a situation where, in fact, the state is, let's just put it like that, the enemy of people who restlessly move around. The state doesn't like people who are you don't know where they are. In the morning, they're here. Midday, they're somewhere else. In the evening, they're restless. And they are usually configured as an inassimilable alterity. When you move too, too much, from the point of view of the liberal state, you cannot be assimilated or you make it too difficult for whoever community polity to, to, to assimilate you. This is because freedom in this sense, in this context, is seen as being about moderation, as implying self-restraint, self-regulation, is not about excess, and in, on the contrary, excessive movement immediately conjures problems of security. Unbound movement is seen as a threat. And the belief is that freedom is only politically valuable if it relies on some mechanisms that regulate the movement that manifests it. And I think that this is true that it is historically proven, both in the history of the West and in the history of colonial expansion overseas. The biggest, I mean, when I, uh, they, once I was a historian, uh, if you want, so I worked in the archives. I used to spend time in the archives uh, writing about uh, whatever. And when, 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 when you read the colonial archives from the beginning to the end, <laughs> One of the biggest problems for the colonial state has to do with how to domesticate the natives. Why? Because the natives are constantly on the move. And you can't build a state 
If you don't control borders, don't control the population, you can't tax them, you can't exercise a monopoly over violence, the usual classical Weberian definition of sovereignty. And you find yourself in this kind of rhizomatic config social configuration where everything seems to be on top of everything else, underneath everything else. There's no transparency, there's no stability. So the big issue was what do we do in order to stabilize these people? So uh, movement then had to be restrained via an array of disciplinary mechanisms for it to be reconciled with freedom. I could go on and on on this, but you get the, uh, uh, the core, uh, uh, let's see, uh, issue. So how is it that you make sure that people don't move restlessly? Liberal thought assumes that those who have an estate, a home, a nation state, or those who have the material conditions allowing them to stay where they are, can better enjoy the right to move freely. Which means that not everybody should be moving freely. In Western political, liberal political tradition, it's not accepted that everybody should be moving freely. It is admitted that those who should enjoy the right to move freely should be, first of all, those people who own something. And the belief is that that something they own tethers them to a place, a location, to which they come back. Because the idea of moving and everywhere or not coming back is not at all taken into consideration here. You are allowed to move and never come back only as um, if you belong to the category of surplus people. And you have a lot of hist historical studies which show, for instance, how in England the poor you, how, how do you get rid of your poor? You get rid of your poor by sending them to Australia, sending them to South Africa, sending them to Canada, and making sure that they don't come back. Through colonialism, then, colonial expansion is, in that sense, part of this process I was calling early on, redistribution of life over the body of the earth. In this case, by reading the nation from those people who cannot stay in one place and who are vagabond, the concept of the, the vagrant in the colonial lexicon. And uh, uh, that is what Kotev argues. We have to add to that, and I think you understand this, the, uh, another configuration which has to do not only with the poor but with the racialized body. Because in this liberal political configuration the racialized body is not simply the body of the poor. It's a different kind of body that has been dishonored. This question of dishonoring and stigmatizing is absolutely central to the constitution of liberalism and of capitalism. And as I try to explain in Critique of Black Reason, this is how historically has been, it has proceeded. So the racial body has to be sequestered. And the sequester, I don't know what's the term in German, but it has quite a powerful resonance in, in English. So we have a different genealogy of order stability if we put into consideration not only gender, class dimensions, but also racial dimensions, the racial body. And as I was arguing two days ago, you have a long genealogy for anyone who is interested in dealing with questions of mass incarceration which are a key 
feature of the US society today. And uh, mass incarceration, confinement, and all that, there's nothing more opposite to the idea of a borderless world than that. So, uh, even more so in, in settler slave owning and settler colonial societies, settler liberty, settler freedom of movement requires the criminalization of countless others and such instances of criminalization and stigmatization were historically indispensable features of liberal government everywhere. So, uh, I think I have been clear enough on this for uh, you to understand where I'm coming from. Now, let me try to move faster and uh, complicate matters even further. Um, I'll make two additional sets of remarks and I'll stop. I will make a set of remarks on another dialectics that is part of our contemporary life at a planetary level is the dialectics of circulation, speed, and containment. And here, uh, I haven't spoken a lot about speed. Let me say a few words about it now. We have spoken about movement, borders, not enough about speed, although I have been intimating that you can't talk about movement without motion without speed. And here, I will rely especially on uh, a thinker, a French thinker called Paul Virilio. Um, Paul Virilio, in um, a piece he wrote long ago, well before some of the uh, developments we see happening now, the piece was called uh, Speed and information. Uh, he was arguing that uh, the twin phenomena of immediacy and instantaneity is presently, this was in the uh, early 80s, one of the most pressing problems confronting us. Uh, I'm quoting him. Or, uh, still quoting him, in any case, one of the most determining factors ushering a new techno-political epoch. So that, from then on, he was very aware of uh, this, this clash. So we can use Virilio's considerations on speed and information to argue that in considering what borders have become and the kind of work they accomplish, or for that matter, what a borderless world might look like, it might be useful to take seriously the possibility that real time now prevails above both real space and the geosphere uh, in, in general. So the primacy of real time, of immediacy, of an above space and surface might not yet be irreversible, but it is in the process of becoming a fait accompli. And in fact, of the three main physical barriers, uh, those of sound, you know, in quantum physics, there are three key barriers. The, the barrier of sound, the barrier of heat, and the barrier of light. There might be some others, but these are the three key structuring barriers. And of the three main physical barriers, the first two have already fallen. The barrier of sound and the barrier of heat. So if you want, we are now struggling against the barrier of light. The sound barrier, um, Virilio argues, uh, has been cut across by the, uh, the super or hypersonic uh, aircraft. The heat barrier uh, is penetrated by the rocket uh, taking human beings outside the Earth's uh, orbit in order to land them in, on other planets. But the third barrier, 
that of light, in fact, might not be something one can cross. You crash into it, and it is precisely this barrier of time which confronts history in the present day. So building from these remarks, we can argue that the moment humanity will reach the light barrier, that is the speed of light, a historical event of unprecedented importance will happen. We will have entered a borderless world. We'll enter a borderless world when we triumph over this, the, uh, the barrier of, of light and the speed that is embedded in uh, the projection of light precisely because we'll have finally domesticated absolute speed. So to some extent, what I'm arguing is that this is a true utopia. The idea of a borderless world is a true utopia because the moment we, these are, don't believe that this will happen, um, and yet we will keep trying to domesticate absolute speed, and if we ever manage to do so, I think the Earth will enter a new period of its history, one in which real time will be totally superseded, will have totally superseded uh, real space. So we are not yet there. So meanwhile, since we are not yet there, uh, an architecture of containment is dominating the ways in which our planet is being reorganized. The planet is being reorganized around an architecture of containment and a division of the populations of the Earth in at least two categories. To put it quickly, on the one hand, the category of those lives which are insured, questions of insurance, meaning those lives which, the death of which has to be motivated, that you cannot kill, nobody should die without reason. And uh, those insured lives are produced through a whole set of mechanisms the welfare state in the West embodies. Where uh, 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 an order, a political order, in which the main function of the state is to protect life and to enhance it and to ensure those lives. So those populations on the one hand and the mass of the uninsured whose life can be taken, exposed or abandoned without any justification being given for it. So it seems to me that when we raise questions of borders, we are speaking to these reallocation, this reapportionment, this repartition of the earth between different sorts of species life, if you want. Species life that are insured and species life that have to fend for themselves. And the border today, as well as, as we move on in, inside the, the century, will precisely uh, act as a barrier to the conjoining of these two. And racism plays a very important part in keeping these two life species separate. And here I don't need to rely on Foucault and his society must def defend it. You remember the last chapters, the last lessons, where he deals with questions of racism. Unfortunately, here again, Foucault, although, I mean, when Foucault is writing, we are, apartheid is at his apogee. It's the highlight of apartheid. But Foucault was not interested in colonialism and, 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 and those worlds beyond Europe. So here again, we have to keep supplementing. <laughs> I'm sorry to keep going back to this uh, figure of speech. Uh, this tradition, 
But if we want to produce a kind of thought that attends to the planetary, which is the moment we are in, then that act of supplementation is absolutely necessary. It is very different from what my friend Dipesh Chakrabarti argues for. He argues for the provincializing of Europe. I don't believe that Europe should be provincialized. I think all corners of the world should be deprovincialized. And it is only at this condition that we will be able to produce a kind of critical thought that is at the measure of the challenges we are facing, whether here in Germany, in France, or in South Africa for that matter. Thank you very much.